So welcome everyone to another Awakening from the Meaning Crisis Discord Q&A. We are here today with Christopher Mastro Pietro, who is John's uh, long-term writing and research partner and the co-author of his, of his book on zombies. And uh, we, we, we've heard, you know, we, we hear your name, Chris, come up all the time through Awakening Through the Meaning Crisis and through John's, uh, John's uh, discussions. Uh, and seeing you talk, but but we, we we I don't think we know a lot about you, uh, you know, mm. other other than through your work. So so could you tell us about yourself? Well, first of all, what, thank you for being here. Thank you, yeah. thank you. It's nice to be here. And uh, yeah, it, no, it's it's a pleasure to have you. So so could you tell us just about yourself? What's your story? Uh, you know, what's your background, and how how did you meet John? Well, um, I think that it's funny when I the. the the actual biography is probably pretty scant on detail and on novelty. It's pretty straightforward, really. I was a student some, oh God, what is it now, some 10 years ago um, when I was an undergraduate at the University of Toronto. I encountered John at the time. I was sort of flitting from one discipline to the next in search of a vocation academically. And, um, and I was uh, doing a major in philosophy, which I then, I then ended up downgrading at the time, but I was doing a major in philosophy and I was trying to find, I would say trying to find an academic home, trying to understand where to pitch my tent. And that was not a straightforward task for me um, before, during, or since. Finding John was a seminal event for me because um, it was the beginning of finding it was the beginning of finding a center around which all of the other interests I had could then be gathered and arranged and organized. And I think he was that to a lot of people long before I ever met, and certainly since then as well. So I was neither the first nor have I been the last person to be um, to, to fall under his particular pedagogical spell. It happened pretty quickly, and thereafter it became it became a kind of uh, it, it was perhaps telling that it fell right at the median of my studies because I can pretty neatly divide my time as a student into a before John Verbeke and an after John Verbeke. And uh, I have a feeling that uh, a lot of people who are listening to this will intuitively know what I mean by that because I think a lot of people have since had the same experience virtually that I did as a student. Um, so there isn't really, I mean, now, insofar as the work with John is concerned, I've been doing it virtually ever since then. I think I met him as a student in 2010, which is 10 years ago, my goodness. Um, and, um, and very soon after that, um, so, I mean, so impressed was I by this course, not, not only the content of the course, but of this particular pedagogical style, that I was, um, I was, I was possessed of the idea to pursue him and to try and insinuate myself into his work in whatever way I possibly could. And that started gradually, it started very slow and, and, and incrementally. Um, but over the course of time, we became, uh, we became, for a while, it remained a student and teacher dynamic, I would say, for a year or two after that. At the time, he was working on a precy to a book um, that would later take many different forms, and eventually parts of it then were distilled and became uh, zombies in Western culture eventually. But at the time it was much more inclusive. I would say everything that you've seen, not everything because a lot of those arguments have developed since then, but I would say the structure of awakening from the meaning crisis was originally going to be one massive volume. And so when I started to work with John, we really, it was attending to that project. And that project soon became so unwieldy that it became clear that it wasn't something we were going to be able to, to eat in one bite, and it would have to be dispersed among a series of projects over the course of time. And of course, those series of projects in and of themselves start to elaborate and start to unspool. And so, you know, you can imagine how the, 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 that, the, the sort of the, um, the, the, the hallway the hallway of a project as you walk down it begins to get farther and farther away as you walk down it. That's very much the experience of, uh, of working on those, those projects. But anyway, so virtually since then, and certainly long since, um, long since leaving school, I've been working on him, working on him, working with him rather, virtually all the while. 
and um, that's sort of uh, I, uh, my my uh, occupationally and my attentions are a little bit divided. I work uh, I'm, I, I work in public policy as uh, as a day job, but uh, but I moonlight as a something of an amateur philosopher, I suppose. I wouldn't think to call myself that, but I suppose this it's something like that. Yeah. And your degree is in semiotics, right? The with the study of symbols and primarily in semiotics. Yeah. Now semiotics, you know, I, I say that with I have to attach some very sizable caveats to that because semiotics semiotics at least as as it was taught at the U of T was I would say more than a concentrated discipline of study unto itself, it was a convenient receptacle um, in which to group a lot of other attendant interests and disciplines. So, you know, a lot of my work with John, for instance, you know, when it was still when it still fell under the category of coursework or classwork, a lot of that I was able to fit under the semiotics banner. Um, because semiotics is semiotics is a discipline that suffers from a bit of an identity crisis, I think. And um, and so that makes it pretty. It's pretty multivocal, and that makes it a convenient. Um, that makes it a convenient placeholder for a lot of other things. It becomes a way of cohering studies rather than studies into itself. At least that's what it's been for me. And then, so so you've been working on, with John on 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 the meaning crisis, and and particularly I guess the the relation of the symbol of the zombie to the meaning crisis. I want to get to the zombies, but. What does the meaning crisis mean to you? What is what does meaning mean to you? Well, I think it's actually easier to to say what the meaning crisis means rather than what meaning means, at least to begin with. I think the meaning crisis phenomenally for me, the meaning crisis is about a gradual recollection coming into awareness of a feeling of lack, a perceptible kind of absence that is, that is felt precisely as an absence. It's, it is, it, it is the inkling that something in virtue of which our beliefs were organized and lived through is now no longer available to us. It is the something by which we knew that is gone. And, and in the absence, sort of imagine that at some point a light faded. And now that that light has faded, all of those structures that were once made intelligible and livable in virtue of that light have lost a certain dimension and have lost a certain texture and have lost a certain geometry that something is no longer livable now in the way that it once was and even though speech still refers to it speech no longer draws it forth because there's a way in which we no longer live in the speech that refers to meaning. And that's what draws it back incidentally into semiotics, right? Because what I think among the things that have been lost in the, lo in the loss of meaning or what we might call meta-meaning, right? The organizing structure of participation that bound us to what was known. Part of what has been lost is the capacity for speech to embody and be possessed of that which it contemplates. So when speaking of God, when speaking of love, when speaking of any number of virtues, the virtues, for instance, that tend to organize the platonic dialogues, when speaking of those virtues, there's a sense in which oftentimes they are not present by the speech that attempts to invoke them. They're invoked, but not invocated. So what does this all mean? What it means is that it's not obvious that it's very, very difficult to 
recollect a source of something that is no longer imminent mm. to us, something that's no longer present. And it's only over the course of time, with a lot of secondary reading and secondary discussions, that it has become clear to me that the way in which we find things meaningful is not the way in which we have always found them. That there is a texture phenomenologically that's somehow been slackened in our relationship to the world. And I think that has a lot to do with the loss of symbolic thinking and literalism as people like Jung and Paul Tillich have, um, have, have explained it. So I think that for me, my particular experience of the meaning crisis, I think centers on the loss of symbolic thinking as a virtue by which to know. And in the absence of that, that life takes on a kind of aimless, vacuous, and slackened sense that somehow sensibly it's it's no longer it no longer holds together tautly and so that uh, i suppose that's somewhere to begin that's somewhere to begin so so what is it about symbols that you think gives it gives them this this ability to help us find that meaning to, to find fill that gap Well, symbols are sort of like, what is a symbol? I, it's, I think it's helpful. I think it's helpful to understand symbols as participable, bat, participable patterns. We, we tend to think of symbols as though we would, um, as we would signs, as things that denote meaning and refer and indicate other phenomena. Um, but a symbol is actually not that fundamentally, and and a lot of people, um, a lot of people have done a lot of work, certainly standing on the shoulders of deeper observations. When I say that, over the course of time, have have tried to observe and explain that properly. That a symbol affects a f phenomenological change in the way that you participate in being in the world, and a symbol unconceals a series of patterns of intelligibility that, when embodied seem to replace the world around you and resituate you in somewhere entirely different. And though the, the aspect of that symbol might be as simple as an object or a person, right? In the case of Tillich has a, a famous example about the nation's flag, right? Or John and I have used the example of a wedding ring. Or certainly there are any number of personages that have taken the place of symbols over the course of time. But the important, the important property of the symbol is that the literal denotation of that object or that person cannot possibly capture the meaning of the symbol because the meaning of the symbol is a gesture of participation that refers beyond itself. If I can use that term, there is a kind of beyondness to the world that is accessed in the care of the symbols when they are embodied and possessed. And when we are possessed of them, there's a kind of interpenetrated quality. So Tillich uses the example of the nation's flag, that when beholding the nation's flag, and I'm not talking about the image that appears on the flag. I think those things are often confused. When I say a nation's flag as a symbol for nationhood, I don't mean the image, the icon, the particular pictograph or whatever appears on the surface of that flag, although that's certainly part of it. I'm talking about the entire motion of that flag when it's suspended at the top of a flagpole and blowing in the wind. That is the symbol. There is a movement of a symbol. There's a motioning quality. And the motioning quality of a symbol is the very thing I think that we interject. And that by interjecting a pattern that seems to gesture away from itself, we become the gesture that refers ourselves away to something that was no longer, that was not previously accessible to us. So when beholding the flag, you are made member and party to a nation. You are made into a patriot. I think Polanyi said something like that. John and I were just talking about that recently. So that your identity, the way you are characterized, changes as a consequence. 
And I think it's helpful to think of it that way. It help, it's helpful to think of a symbol as implicating you in a process of being recharacterized, having your identity replaced, and in so doing, being resituated in the world entirely, as to open access to experiences in the world that were formerly not accessible to you. And the symbol pries open the cracks of intelligibility and allows the more of the world to become known to you and present to you in a very embodied way, right? And that's the thing about symbols that contradistinguishes them from signs is that they are, they are patterns to be embodied and not things to be referred. So, so the, there's a lot of depth to, to symbols. And so you know, what, what, one thing we're, we're, about, we're focused on here is the religion that's not a religion. And my instinct tells me that, that the religion that's not a religion needs symbols and maybe its own symbols. But it raises the question, can you deliberately create symbols or, or do they sort of arise? Uh, can, can you, can, you know, can you come up with a, I guess, a sign that becomes that has the, the potential to become a symbol? Or, or is it just like, can you sit down and say, I'm going to come up with a symbol? Or is it something that has to come out of some sort of instinct, some sort of uh, insight uh, and discovery process? I, I hope that makes sense, that, that question. It does. No, no, it, it does. It does. a really good question. And it's, well, I think it's, it's one, of the, one of the axiomatic formulations of the symbol, definitionally, that Tillich uses. And Jung, this is, this is a, a definition that he and Jung independently converge on. It's precisely that you cannot simply invent a symbol. Now, there's, there's a little bit of interpretive latitude, I think, that we might take. John and I are, are starting to talk about um, the idea of reinventio as a concept that is neither, that is neither, that neither arises wholly within nor wholly without, that it's somehow somewhere between invention and discovery, that there is a poetic agency on the part of the individual, but also a kind of ontological request that it somehow emerges neither from the world to the individual nor from the individual to the world, but somewhere on a shared horizon where those two things meet. So perhaps when we're talking about the word invention, if we were to qualify the definition and qualify it deeply, then perhaps we could find a way in which that might be true. But I think, no, fundamentally, it's, it's one of the most significant properties of the symbol that it can't simply be conjured um, by the will of an individual, that it's something that emerges. Now, how and why and from what it emerges, I suppose, is where we parcel this, and this could get quite difficult and, um, and technical, depending on whose line of thinking that we want to follow. I think, obviously, for someone like Jung, the symbols emerge as a way of mediating the conscious with the with the, the archetypal fundamentals of the unconscious. And that, that's a way of integrating and individuating the dimensions of the self in its wholer state. That the symbol is a, is a power of mediation between what is, what is mysterious uh, and, and seems to dwell outside the boundaries of the ego. And, and then the sheer inexhaustibility of that mystery that somehow the symbol is it's a spillway for the oceanic of the inexhaustible that allows it to possess what is what remains within the boundaries of a frame influence it but not overwhelm it so there's like imagine the symbol as a kind of aperture that helps to organize our visioning of the world and depending on how it organizes our visioning of the world, it will ultimately determine what of the world we see. So that was a very long way of saying, no, yeah, you can't just, you can't simply conjure them. And so then obviously then the, the observations that I guess the, 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 the corollary to that is, well, if we can't simply invent a symbol and we're, we're, we, we're, we're, living at a time when our sacred symbols have been exhausted and largely turned into idols for a lot of people. What then, what kind of power of intervention do we have to be able to recover the kind of meta meaningfulness that only symbols can provide and only symbols can organize? 
it is not an easy question. If, if, if I knew the answer to that question, there would be no need for all of this work. So, uh, so just on a on a practical level, is it something we sort of just have to just keep an eye out for? You know, as we're going through, you know, we're we're trying to come up with certain certain rituals and ecology of practices. Are, are there things we can look for that? You know, will will symbols just become manifest, and and we'll just well, notice them and and say, "Ah, that's it." That's a good question. I think I think that um, I mean symbols, like certainly the symbols that we know that have become epochal, have not have not risen in a single instant. You know, they have done so imperceptibly and gradually, and their dawning has been a gradual dawn. It, it's sort of like the, their dawning has been of a Heideggerian kind, whereby the, you know, you're not aware that the symbol has dawned until you become aware that the thing in virtue of which you see and know backs onto that symbol, right? And that, and that, I mean, be, and because of that, all of the Platonic and Neoplatonic metaphors of the sun and of light are so appropriate. Because if it's the thing in virtue of which you see, it in and of itself cannot be seen, save with the, the prosthesis of certain practices that help to recollect um, and to, I mean, that's the whole idea of, of, I think the whole idea of Platonic anagogy, the whole idea of Platonic ascent is precisely to come to know, to come into the knowing by that which you know. And, and in so doing, recollect what is most fundamental to you, what is most fundamental to your phenomenology. Um, I think though, and this is some of the work that John and I are doing right now, is that dialogos, what we've, what we've called dialogos, uh, which isn't precisely dialogue to say, but is a certain emergent praxis and symbolic ritual process that involves dialogue, seems to be emerging, and I say this with all due caution, and, and you know, because precisely because these, precisely because symbols are so complex and, and mysterious, it's difficult to pronounce upon them, and it's very difficult to pronounce upon them prematurely. And, and, you know, I would never want to do that. But it seems to be one of the properties of the symbol, and, and this is implicit in its etymology, is that it, it is combinative. It combines things together. It is a bridge, right? It erects bridges from one domain of experience or category of experience into another, right? Which is precisely how it can mediate what is bounded and conscious with what is unbounded and unconscious is precisely because it is a kind of phenomenal bridge and an ontological bridge to so those domains of to so those to those domains that are not imminent to us practically. So dialogos, what it seems to do is many things, right? It seems to combine well in this in this particular medium, what it does is it seems to combine something like a public performance or almost like a public dramaturgy with private intimate intimacy and intimation now that's a really really powerful combination right so there's something about the way dialogue or, or dialogos i suppose to use it technically exacts the function and the phenomenology of interpersonal relating and all of its intimacy all of its particular virtues and vulnerabilities and, and exacts it within a psychotechnology of dialectic to leaven the soul, to leaven that part of us which mediates what is in framed and what state where we can appreciate as, as mysterious, that we're not completely and utterly overwhelmed by in a way that we're you know we're not completely destroyed by right that's one of the things that the dialogic practice does is it's not simply a good time with your buddies it's not community for community's sake certainly i'm not interested in anything that's community for its own sake for me the communitas of the logos is such that you it it presents you with the aspect of your own mystery 
And then the care and the carriage of your interlocutors, of the vows that you're corresponding with, more of yourself is alluded to you, just as more of the world is alluded to you. So there's a kind of coupling, there's a collapsing together of, and that's also what makes it, to use John's term, transjective, right? That it's neither subjective nor objective. It's neither a revelation solely of personal mystery, nor a revelation solely of extrinsic mystery or external mystery. It is precisely a combination of those two things that seems to build a relation between everything about oneself that is undisclosed and everything about the world that is undisclosed and seems to pair the revelation together in such a way that it seems to move you closer to the center of what is real. And that happens in the care of community. That happens in the care of conversation. So it does seem that theologos, and in ways that are allowed by the, the, the prosthesis of this kind of forum, for instance, does seem to be a process that affords some of those some of those virtues and features that were afforded by religious ritual. And now, is Dialogos a symbol, per se? I don't know. I don't know that I'm ready yet to pronounce upon Dialogos and understand its nature fully. But there seems to be something of symbolic value and nature in Dialogos. And so perhaps, and it seems to be emerging quite, or re-emerging, I should say, quite naturally. Um, but with but certainly, it seems to be a, a flame that sprung of its own accord, but certainly sand and stoked by communal attention. And it's precisely that combination, I think, that, um, that, that seems to hold some promise. We, we've been experimenting with uh, Dialogos here uh, in the Discord as well. So we're trying to, to tap into that uh, ourselves. I'd like to, to, to bring in some questions. So, so yeah, please, if you have a question, just queue it up in the event text uh, channel. So the first question is from Mark Lefebvre, who, who isn't here today, but he gave a question in advance. Uh, I was hoping you could expand on your, comp on your concept of domicide and how you believe that it is currently impacting our societies. Also, what is the connection between religio and domicide with respect to the meaning crisis? Mm. Mm, okay. Well, domicide, um, which is that, so the reference is probably, I, I can only assume it's excerpted from either John series or from Zombies in Western Culture. And there's a case study, there's a case study in Zombies in Western Culture, a couple of them, um, paint the definition of domicide as fundamentally a loss of home, not big wall. We borrow that. And the loss of home, to understand the significance of domicide as the loss of home, we have to understand first the significance of home, which is obviously not the edifice of a particular space, but a, but a, but a world that has two fundamental features. And this comes also from Geertz's idea of worldview attunement in the meta meaning system of religion, that it both tells us what the world is to us and prescribes a normativity for how to interact with it. And those are two things that the eclipsing, I would say, of at least if we're talking about, let's confine this observation to the West for a moment, that the the eclipse, the gradual eclipsing of the Christian world has left us unmoored because we no longer have a consistent, reliable, and renewable idea of both what the world is at any given moment, how to gain a purchase on it, and what acts it prescribes from us, how to cohere ourselves in relation to it. It is the loss of a certain form of being in relation. Because we're always in relation, right? We're always subsisting in relation. It is just a question of how that relation is characterized. And domicide is the recharacterization of that fundamental relation 
as one of estrangement, as one that is no longer intimate, right? Again, if we take that, once again, fall back to the analog of the personal relation as a way of understanding this, Domicide is what happens when the relation we have with the world, as though it is the relation we have with our partner in conversation, is no longer coherent. We can no longer converse with the same vocabulary. We can no longer gain a read, a legible read on what the other person is thinking. We don't know who we are to them anymore. We don't know what they're about to say. And when they do speak, it is, it, it, it's in a, it's in a, uh, an, an indistinguishable language that somehow that, that 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 there's no longer a feedback loop in that relation that tells us who we are to that other person, what is expected from us, and how we might intervene to deepen the relation even further. So if we take that analog of the personal relationship and imagine when the relationship begins to grow diffident and fractured, and when it becomes cold to the touch, and and then transplant that analogy onto the world itself. And this is precisely what the zombie metaphor does, right? Because the world of the zombie apocalypse is cold to the touch, right? It's, it's decadent without being rich. It's lifeless. It's corpse, fundamentally. It's, it, it doesn't offer any kind of sustained vitality. And so domicide is really... The loss, if I had to put it perhaps in a pithy way, I would say it is the loss of intimacy in our fundamental relation with the world. Do you, do you see something like the religion that's not a religion as a, a way back home? I don't know. Full stop, I'm afraid. I don't know. I think, I think it's, a, it's an incredibly ambitious project. I should say that it's a part of John. I mean, I'm certain I've, a lot of the work that I've been doing with John certainly contributes to its attendant features. Having said that, I, it's the religion that's not a religion as a kind of as a kind of banner project is not something that I've been interacting with as directly. Um, I trust it's being undertaken with all the right bona fides, certainly, and with the right humility. Um, but I find myself even mournfully, and it is mournful. I find myself a little too steep in my own religious ancestry to be completely credulous that such a thing is possible. You know, I believe it's a project worth undertaking. I do. And, um, and no one is more capable of undertaking it uh, than, than, than John and company. But precisely because the nature of the symbol as a cohering mechanism for religion is spontaneous and emerges from what is already given in our being. It has such a project has to be approached, I think, with, with great, with great care. And I think that, so I, yeah, I guess that's a way of saying, I don't know. I really don't know. Um, but I, but I look to it with great interest and, and, and faith faith in the proper sense of the term. Because what is happening, I mean, the, the very thing that is motivating, the impetus that is motivating is the same impetus that is trying to call attention to what has been happening beneath our awareness for a very, very long time. And that means that it's, a, it's, it's already suffused with a lot of humility and a lot of caution. Yeah, I think that's how I feel about that. Oh, fair, fair enough. And I think it's, it, I think, it, yeah, I think a lot of us here see it as the same way, an experiment that's, that's worth, worth trying and devoting our time and attention to and, and to see what, see what we can do with it. Yeah, it's, it's really, it's really important to understand that, that, you know, there's a certain irony in the term, I and mean, I know there is, um, the, the religion that is not a religion and it's important i think for anyone for anyone who's participating um directly or indirectly in experimentally participating in that idea it's important to approach it ironically what i mean by that it's important to approach it knowing it will not 
be, it will not fulfill the function in its full gestalt form. It will not fulfill the function that the emergent axial religions fulfilled, at least not for a very, very long time, if at all and if ever. So I think that having, <laughs> having measured expectations is like a supreme understatement here, okay? I think there's a certain amount of, I think you, you have to keep due reverence for what has passed, even if it's no longer present to you, even if you no longer feel it and feel moved and breathed by it. Meaning by it, I mean, let's say, the, 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 you know, the Western religions that have now, um, now have, that have now been subject to centuries of declension. Even if you don't feel those breathing you still, and I'm, I'm a case in point because I find it very, very hard to become possessed of the faith that is necessary to be a true and authentic and pious believer. I find that very difficult. But even absent that, I think it's very important that we understand the complexity of the functions that they serve and how we cannot simply reproduce those functions with um, with a feature list of design features. Now that I'm not saying that's what that's what John and Jordan Hall and the company, I'm not saying that's what they're doing. They understand the scope and the gravity of this problem as well as I do and that um, so that's not what they're doing. They're, they're undertaking this task, I think, with that irony. But I think it's also important that everyone who's taking an ancillary interest in that project and feeding into it understands the irony of that project. And, you know, and, and understands that um, it's, it's not simply that suddenly a series of experiments are going to produce a new religion. I, that's not how it works. And, um, and I think anyone who thinks that that's how it works has, um, has, has, has grossly underestimated the, 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 the breadth and complexity and, of the phenomenon of religion in the first place. Helix, uh, you, have, you have a question for Chris. You there, Helix? Or I'll read it out. All right, he, Helix's question was, are there cycle... Oh, there he is. No, you can go ahead. Oh, please, would, would you... Would you read it for me? I have a bit of a headache right now. <laughs> sure, no I, problem. I like I like how you read. Thank you. Are there any psychotechnologies not mentioned in the Meaning Crisis video series that you think are worth knowing? Are there any other psychotechnologies not mentioned in the Meaning Crisis series that I think are worth knowing? That's a good question. I'm sure there are. Could I not? No, if I could. I don't. Keep that in mind, though. Let's a little bit. And, and we'll see if something. I. Yeah, I have to stay on the same Sure. Uh, and sorry, I'm getting a bit of feedback. Thank I, you. Is, I'm not. Yeah, well, well, we can come back to that. Uh, I think I was getting a little bit of feedback. I'm not sure if it's me or is anybody else getting feedback uh, on Chris or is it just me right now? I'm getting feedback. Uh, uh, hold on, maybe me. I'm just gonna. I'm just, just give me one Ready second. Me, I'm, I'm I'm gonna leave and and come back. One one second. Try to close some windows. Fascinating, uh, uh, especially to be embedded within it and to, to see how it's forming up. It it reminds me less of uh, truly a, a kind of groundswell of a religious movement and more like a symposium or something more like one of the ancient Greek schools. That's kind of the the sense I get more of it just being around it that the that the ideas are clustered around these kinds of central themes and it's helping to make sense of the world and you know maybe there's some like political leanings here or there but none of it is clustered around that uh, and so it's very very much this head kind of heady space up here um, and more recently there's been a lot of uh, an attempt to bring in ritualistic elements 
Um, and now Brett's bringing up uh, symbols. There, there is still like yet this yearning for I think the other stuff, these other um, deeply embedded kind of ancient, uh, you know, atavistic compulsory needs that we had embody it. So something has to occur, if not leading the flock back to whatever they've strayed from, um, just in re-engendering the, the authentic expression of that stuff. That, that it really is a hunger, and see it in the people that come here and keep coming here, trying to, uh, it's like, just like kids, trying to uh, notions of what it would be to be a fireman. Or, uh, there's uh, there's and I, I too, on, um, I, I appreciated his ex. Uh, it's, uh, you see, you're like, what words seem to me are, are like handles that can move mountains, you know? They're like these little yeah, touchstones right. that you have that just uh, are, are connected to these immense structures that can be shifted in tiny little handles so i i love i love language for that reason i love anyone giving us tools that didn't give us the capacity to move those much larger mountains we didn't even know existed and uh and, and i'm trying to encourage that as much as i can and there's a component of the religion that's not a religion and a component to religion itself that has to do with i think expression and and you know why the logos is bound up in that and so yeah, that, and, and I really appreciate your sense of language too. Thank you for it. It's um, it, it brings color to it, brings texture back to an idea that is you know, a lot of times um, conveyed in a very analytical or kind of um, contextually limited space. Let's say. So, thanks. Thank you for that, Tyler. That was beautifully said. Um, you uh, you have a you have a clear gift and. And I think that you're right. You're absolutely right that there's something about what this particular exercise does. This this communal venture in dialogue, I think, changes the orientation of our speech mm -hmm. such that the words we use. I'm thinking of that. There's a there's a there's a Buddhist adage that. Uh, about you know that when words become fingers pointing at the moon, <laughs> um, I think that's what happens. That's what happens when the logos of speech, the intelligibility of reasoning, is embedded within something dramaturgical. Maybe that allows me to gesture back to your earlier question, Felix, about another psychotechnology. I can't remember to what degree John does or doesn't talk about this in the series. But drama and dramaturgy increasingly, to me, allude themselves as a contexture in which to change the way we use speech and to create from it something like a symbolic affordance for unfolding a world that we can then live in. Because if you think about what Plato does, for instance, that's, I mean, Plato's, uh, it's a, it's a, I think it's a, con it's a very common uh, and almost canonical mistake. And I say mistake at this point to simply excerpt, to try and excerpt theories from Plato and then lay them out as though they're meant to be taken independently of independent value. But it seems clear that that's not the case. It seems like the dramaturgies, the dialogues, the way that they're characterized, the way that the, the vocality with which they are embodied in personalities that are then exchanging intimacy is essential to their meaning. It is essential to the over-significance of their meaning beyond the semantic content of anything that the character says, it's the relationship that the characters have between each other and the way the speech becomes suffused with that relationship and the speech intervenes in the orientation of that relationship. That is something like the, at the level at which uh, the reasoning of philosophy seems to be calibrated, at least within Plato. Um, 
so to your point about the symposium, Tyler, I see that too. And I think that um, the other the other quality that's very important about that is that you know it might be taking place under the under the auspices of a particular virtue or definition that has been subject to discussion. But it's clear in those dialogues that the real meaning of the discussion remains mysterious to its participants. It remains over and above. It remains supremely unknowable, except in part to its participants. So I think that one of the things that, I think that these kinds of, these communities this community, for instance, so I mean, this particular one, obviously, I'm new to, I won't presume upon it, but dialogic communities in general, I think have great capacity and great potential, provided that they remain somewhat apparatic, meaning provided that they always remain possessed of mystery, and they never, they never try to lay too much claim to the insight that emerges as a consequence of that dialogue and as a consequence of that community, right? The, yeah, yeah. The, true, the true meaning and definition of the dialogue is always, always beyond us and ahead of us, and we will not catch up to it. We will not. Well, it's, it seems to be the free and equal exchange of the energy back and forth is what defines this flow state, right? And so no, no, there's no claim on either end and two or three or four or five or a community of this size as to the direction of the flock, right? There, there's something that's that's in the deep respect that you have in the the, the relaying and the receiving of energy, right? And, and the way that you're uh, receiving descriptions of the world and transforming them and matching them with your own and, and then sending that back out. If you, you, you share that equally amongst all, the collective sense making seems to be much more capable of, of providing that kind of unified approach where there's a coherence on an understanding of the world. And anytime it seems that one, uh, you know, kind of voice dominates or, or becomes overproductive, it seems there's there's something there's some strange component to this, right? Like uh, it's noted by uh, I think Emerson and an essay early on about uh, the American philosopher that. Um, Genius is always sufficiently the enemy of genius by virtue of over influence. That, yeah. that there's something to just um, becoming so dominant a signal and so expressive an impulse in the network that you kind of almost prevent its unified and collective adaptation. It's really interesting. Uh, but it, it does kind of represent a really interesting um, strategic niche, right? Like, uh, English dramatists, because they followed Shakespeare, got really, really good at doing it. So there's something to that expertise component that, that is meaningful, I suppose. But in, at least in our time, it does seem necessary when there are too many elements in the world for us to cogently examine on our own, to distribute that amongst ourselves, and then to be in a reliable network of that distributed trust so that we can make sense of all the elements that we can't match on our own. So there's some some element of that strategy that won't work here, and that the collective wisdom that we're searching for is both leveling up our capacity to transmit how we see the world, and then developing a trust by capable of doing so. Mm. So I'm right in line with that component of whatever John is working on, right? Like, if if that emerges from this whole process, I think it will be truly something special, right? It will be the the wedding component of this technological layer and the way that this shapes everything that we do at, in, in this scale and then our own inner capacity to develop these these networks of information. Any other just thoughts? All right, so Aunt Delachiel has a question. Thank you for that. Oh, I, 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 oh okay. Yeah, okay. So what is an ideology? What should we pay careful attention to so the religion that's not a religion doesn't devolve into a pseudo-religious ideology? Mm. That's a really good question. Um, I think... I think one possible definition of an ideology, insofar as I understand it. Well, let's take, I mean, let's take the root of the word, right? It is a it is a logos for the organization of ideas. Um, 
So it is a kind of a mechanism of heuristics that organize the meaning of any given set of information and conform it to a particular way of knowing and way of seeing the world. Um, so that is, I think, one of the one of the, the the properties of an ideology is that it tends to behold phenomena in a way that in a way that um, concentrates them all into the same point of closure. That is a way of understanding that is consistent from one situation to the next and is not adaptive insofar as the constraints of that logos, the constraints of how information is understood, don't change from one situation to the next. Um, so, I mean, one of the, one of the things that makes nationalism for instance, ideological, is that every problem becomes a problem of the nation. Every problem becomes a problem of the nation because the identity of the nation is the qualifying, it is the qualifying intelligibility by which everything else becomes important, by which everything else becomes meaningful. You are meaningful and important insofar as you are meaningful and important to the nation. A particular proposal becomes important and valuable insofar as it is valuable to the entity of the relation, to that level of residue. So it's a kind of, it's the bed of procrustus, right? It's a template. It's a template of meaning and importance, or John might say a template of relevance, that frames every kind of problem or every kind of encounter with the same set of evaluative criteria. I am going to evaluate this proposal based on this set of criteria every single time, rather than to allow the introduction of a novel entry or a novel book to reorganize the set of criteria by which I know a given thing. So if I am beholden to my nationalism, for instance, and I encounter a person who is in disagreement with me propositionally about my, let's say, my fealty to the nation, but is otherwise a dynamic and, um, and erudite and a person who otherwise clearly has a lot of independent value and virtue that I could benefit from, the ideological person, oh, and I'm, I'm being a little bit I'm taking this to its extremes, I suppose, for the purpose of illustrating it. But, you know, the, the supremely ideological person would dismiss that second person out of hand. Whatever other qualities they seem to possess or introduce, they could not be accommodated because they were not consistent with the criteria by which all things are meaningful and important, namely by importance to the nation or by agreement nation. So I think that, I mean, you know, without getting too polemical about it, I think that we're seeing a lot of that right now. A lot of the conversations around, around social justice, I think, give us some good examples about this. Because regardless of, you know, notwithstanding the merit of any one proposal, you know, what they tend to do oftentimes is have a way of framing a problem and then any time a new problem or a new situation encount is encountered, that frame then becomes the way of knowing how that problem is important to the exclusion of all other ways. So, um, yeah, I think that would be, it's a bit of a, it's a, it's a rough scaffold, but that, that would be the definition I'd offer. Is that, is that helpful? Do you want to follow up on that? No, I think it's follow up. It's, so how should we, what, what can we do to avoid falling into the the pseudo real into a pseudo religious ideology so ah well i mean one of the classic very classical ways of doing it is using something like like a socratic elenchus you know um um which is to 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 which is to deny yourself 
the very is to deny yourself the givenness of the proposition to allow for yourself to lapse into a genuine mode of ignorance right um i mean one thing that socrates does is he continually presents new versions new species of a definition to show that the originating definition of any given term is lacking that it is not accommodate it's not accommodating of the totality of its all of its possible referees right and he does that to show that 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 there's a lot of definitional instability to speech and the way that we proffer it and a, an ideological mode of thinking takes speech as absolute it takes speech as, it takes the, the the denotative structure of speech as as absolutely prescriptive and and one of the things that the socratic elenco process does is it dispossesses the literal speech of its capacity to envelop ever more and ever more numerous problems so um so something like i mean so i, I know that um i know that uh, uh actually to, to to be very concrete and um, i'm going to butcher it here but i think peter peter limberg has been on this server right no no he he we we haven't had him on but we, okay gosh. well peter peter is someone that that you may want to talk to because he i know he has a he and 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 some other people i can't i can't attribute it properly because i only know this in passing but he has a, a, a method, I think he calls it mimetic mediation, of trying to invert the process of debate through a, through a series of paraphrasals to try and make sure that two interlocutors are absolutely certain that they understand the propositions expressed by one another before then building on them. So it's a kind of rhetorical style of, of qualifying um, the logos of propositions so that they don't, so that they are qualifying the logos of propositions as they're being made so that they don't become ways of thinking and they simply become things to be known or not known. That might, sorry, that might have been a little bit, uh, uh, that might have been a little bit abstruse. But I, I, what, what, I, what I mean by that is that, um, is that there are, there are, there are ways of conversing um, that that can disarm ideological thinking precisely because they become so probative that once they put an ideology back on its heels, once they reduce it to its axioms, then then it's revealed that um, that there's that there's there's really nowhere to go from there. Right? They they turn the ideological way of knowing into an apolia by introducing a situation that it cannot accommodate without stunting. Excellent. Uh, Kadai has a question. What do you think of the various personality theories and their potential for, for, for providing individuals with the framework for a divine double, more so MBTI and Enneagram, as they have developmental aspects? Mm. Well, I can only be, I can only paint in really broad strokes on this one because I'm no expert and I, I don't, won't, won't tend to be. Um, I think that they're, I think, well, I think that they're, they're helpful. I think they're helpful insofar as they allow us to affect shifts in our identity that allow us to access aspects of our experience and aspects of our possibility that were formerly not accessible to us. One of the things I think that personality tests do is they frame, they frame your knowledge of yourself in such a way as to invite you to play yourself out in different ways, mm -hmm. to give attention to different kinds of your behaviors, to give attention to different kinds of activities that you might otherwise not undertake. I, I would certainly not take them literally in the sense that I wouldn't take any I wouldn't take any personality designation as rote gospel uh, unequivocally true about a person because I think that would be a, a, an idolatrous way of understanding yourself as bounded with certain categorical um, designations. I, I, I think that would be that it would be a mistake. It would be a mistake to entrust that kind of test with a literal understanding of your ego. However, 
I think that as an exercise of playing yourself out with more versatility and drawing your attention to aspects of your experience that have gone unattended, I think it's in that way that those are probably very helpful. I mean, I think of someone like, you know, back, I mean, backing onto someone like you and he used those in a very practical or we might even say pragmatic fashion, right? The personality test was, was a way of framing your confrontation with the self. It was helpful insofar as it prescribed a mode of engagement. And that's how I think we should look at this whole process. That's how we should look at not, on, not only any given personality test, but any given, um, any, given, any given philosophical proposal is it's helpful insofar as it cordons off a playing field in which you can then exercise possibility. And so that it is in that that I would find value. That was really interesting. And, and I, I suppose sorry, there was a divine double in there too that I completely skated over. But in the it, the, the well, I, I suppose that fits insofar as your, I mean, your 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 divine double is precisely the aspect of self that is submerged in the mystery that is then explored once you frame the playing field for yourself. Well, Struan asks. How can we transform the intelligible into the livable from a symbolic perspective? Oh, <laughs> great question, Stuart. How can we transform the intelligible into the livable? What was the end of that question? From a symbolic pers from a symbolic from perspective. From a symbolic perspective. Yeah. Huh. I think that's I think that's the the question. Um I, I think I don't I don't know if I have an answer for it because I think it's the question that frames the problem. I think I think this kind of praxis has a lot to do with it. I think ritual has a lot to do with it because I think the kind of content. I mean, symbolic contemplation is the form of contemplation that possesses the one contemplating with that which is contemplated. Right, the coupling of of what is viewed with the vision that views it is precisely the sim it's precisely the prerogative of the symbol to do that at least phenomenologically um but in the absence of in the absence of available powerful available symbols that obviously becomes a very tall order so I suppose I'll just, I mean, all I can really do is gesture to what is going on here in this moment and in this broader, in this broader series of practices and wonder aloud as to if they might offer, if they might offer some way forward to that effect. I don't know. It's a good question. David asks, what are your own ecology of practices? What are my own ecology of practices? Mm, that's a good question. Um, I do, I have, um, I have spent some time practicing meditation. I don't do it regularly. Uh, I did learn from John years ago. Um, and uh, I do it quite intermittently. I'm not the most consistent or the most faithful of uh, of participants when it comes to practices in general. I, I'd like to become more so. I'm remarkably inconsistent. I think it's just a feature of my temperament sometimes that I tend, I, I tend to wander a lot and I tend to become distracted with all kinds of different activities. I do a lot of writing. I would say writing is the most consistent and reliable practice. Um, and I do it dialogically. I write dialogically uh, fairly often and I do it per I, I do it. I go. I, I tend. I tend to. I tend to pair writing and walking a fair bit. Obviously, not quite at the same time, um, but sequentially, I tend to pair those a lot. Um, I do. I do a lot of this in my in my private spheres of life. I do a lot of dialoguing um, with, uh, with 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 close friends who have these mutual interests, um, and. Um, and I, yeah, I would say those are, I, w I would say some combination thereof 
ha I've, I've fashioned into something of a makeshift ecology that uh, that seems to work for me. I, I spend I spend a lot of time um, I spend a lot of time in silence and solitude, um, and and I, I I use that to break up a lot of these practices, and I find that actually very helpful. I find fits of activity followed by or preceded by long lingering periods of silence and solitude very very helpful. I find that I find the I find the opponent process between those two extremes very helpful. And I find combining that with some form of physical movement or activity also it doesn't have to necessarily be too exerting or too dramatic. But I find pairing those together allows me a certain latitude for contemplation that um, that spatializes my my time in a way that um, that that uh, I find uh, has some vitality. I'm not I'm not the I'm not the best <laughs> I don't have the rigor or the discipline or the consistency of many other people I know when it comes to finding routine and regularity in these kinds of things. I do them, uh, I'm very improvisational. So I'm, I'm certainly no such authority on how to cultivate one. Well, you're welcome to join us here in the Discord. Those are all things we're working on, too. So uh, mm -hmm. you're welcome anytime. I just want to check up on time, speaking of time. Uh, we still have a few, a few more questions. Uh, we've gone about an hour, though. Do you... Do you do you have time to stick around for a bit or? Uh, yeah, I'm fine. Okay, absolutely. Oh, great. Uh, uh, so, Burbas or <laughs> BRBZ uh, asks, what kind of knowing is implied when one asks when one says an arrow flies true? Quote, and how would you figure this kind of truth in conjunction with propositional truth and perhaps the other three P's of knowing as well? Hmm. Can you read that one more time? What kind of knowing is implied when one says an arrow, quote, flies true? And how would you figure this kind of truth in conjunction with propositional truth and perhaps the other three P's of knowing as well? Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. It's a very provocative question. I think um, I have to, I have to, I have to, I have to venture with my imagination a little bit to understand the question. Although in so doing, I think perhaps I've caught into the meaning of it. I think that the kind of knowing implied by the chirotic arrow that strikes true is the knowing implied by faith or the kind of proleptic form of knowing that imagines, and I say imagines, I, I, I use that word advisedly because the poesis of imagination is required in order to make in order to make the logos of speech into the logos of symbol, in order to render it into a world that is then possessible and is then participable. I think it is somehow the casting of one's aspect ahead of oneself, usually with the help and care of interlocutors, that affords the possibility for loosing that arrow in the first place. Because it involves attention to, it involves attention to the emergence of something that is not accounted for by a particular frame of knowing. In other words, well, I'll, I'll give you an example. I mean, this, for instance, this very format of relating that we're doing right now. This is very new to me. Um, this side of kind of virtual online forum and community is a very, very new thing to me. And if I'm being completely frank, I was, I was, um, I was very, very reluctant, and I always still am very, very reluctant to engage it and to join it. I have a prejudicial um, 
I have a I have a prejudicial hesitancy when it comes to online discourse in any form. And that's not simply because that's not simply because I'm taking the the the, the more invective models um, as as exemplars. I mean, I, I I was perfectly willing to admit long ago that there were that there were online arenas that ostensibly were 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 oriented properly. But so it's not that. Even then, I was very reluctant. And I think it's because something about this process always risks dispossessing the ego. My ego, for instance, always risks dispossessing it of some of its of some of its its um, its axiomatic fixtures, things that tend to hold it intact at any given moment. I know that every time I venture into this, even right now, it's very likely that I'm going to find myself disarmed and become less than. And I'm going to discover things about my knowing that were not known to me. I'm going to be made opaque to myself momentarily whereas before I may have been transparent. That's a very deeply, deeply disconcerting experience. It's, it's existentially unnerving, and it's apparatic, precisely because it brings us to the precipice of where we turn into our own mystery and then become unknown to ourselves. An exercise like that, like this, for instance, is precisely the Kairos for self-transcendence for that very reason. So when does your knowing become the arrow that strikes true? It becomes the arrow that strikes true when its target is not even defined within the ambit of defined things that you already hold intact in your model of yourself and your model of the world. When what you're shooting for is the space between the syllables of your given speech. And that only happens, I think, when you're teetering on the precipice. Um, so I think that's the best I can do with that one. Well, uh, it's Ross had at the end too there, and it's, that is exactly how it feels, I think, to be rightly saying something, is to be feeling between those syllables, is to be it's to be pulling like up into that space that which meaning needs from you know the chaos of of all of the things that we know right and, and to be to be pulling that forward rightly at the time that it's needed in the way that it's needed and to be doing it in each beat of the moment that's it's exactly how it feels and to give people that as a gift for them to experience it themselves i think it's a phenomenal way for people to come to understand something like the potential of human beings. I, I think it really is what many people point into and have and, and often do point to that this love of philosophy, this love of wisdom, this love of, of rightly speaking and rightly knowing that that's, it is a gift that we should be giving more of to each other. So, yeah. I think you have to be willing to be shown to yourself and to be shown to yourself in the care of those who may see you as you haven't been able to see yourself. And if you can relinquish your sense of agency long enough to place yourself in the hands of something that can know you more, then that act of faith will yield. It will yield something. It's a very difficult and I think we're all. And that's why it requires the development of, of trusting an intimate relationship to do it. Sorry, Kajaka, what were you going to say? No, I was going to say I, I, I think I can speak for all of us that we're grateful you overcame your reluctance and uh, and and decided to join us uh, today. So this has been been great. Uh, uh, Jester, be good. Uh, you were speaking of po poesis. Uh, if can you ask Christopher how poesis comes to him and through him? in the context of beautifully structured language. And actually, if you could define poesis for, for everyone while you're answering this, that would be great. 
uh, uh, define poesis. Um, well, I mean, I, I, I suppose, I suppose most basically, poesis is creation. Um, if, and if we mean it, if we mean it linguistically, then it is, it is the, it is the, it is the invocation of the world in the manner of speech. I mean, one of the things that poetry, good poetry does, is poetry turns language against itself and ruptures itself open. I had, a, I can't remember who said this. I wish I could attribute it properly, but I've heard, I've heard a lot. There's a quote that, you know, good, good, good poetry strives for its own extinction. Um, it, 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 it seeks to emancipate itself from the linguistic boundaries from which it originates. Well, from perhaps not from which it originates, but it, it, in which it is formed. And and that's why that's why poetry, which has now become so estranged from the project of the contemporary philosopher, is it's it it I think it has to be reintroduced. Those those two need to be remarried, the poet and the philosopher. Um, there's a quote about. Uh, sorry, I'm 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 shooting in a few different directions here, but I'll come back to the question. But it it reminds me. There's a there's a quote. I think I can't remember if it was Heidegger or Reiner Schumann, Sherman, who uh, who um, who wrote of Heidegger, who said that you know philosophy philosophy opens the way by which an unutterable experience may be given. And that's why philosophers, just like the poets, I think when they're working at their best, they use language in such a way they bend it against itself as to create from it openings through which the ineffable can protrude. And I think that a lot of that happens in translation. Um, so poesis in the context of philosophy, I think, is using the affordances of language to try and gesture, simply gesture beyond its meaning. That's why celebrated the philosophers that are perhaps most celebrated are the ones that have managed to do that. They're the ones that have managed to disinter a world from within speech and pronounce it upon us in such a way that we could find ourselves in it and living through it. I mean, that's why Heidegger is Heidegger, right? That's why he, Heidegger is so revered. It's precisely because he does that. Because you travel through Heidegger, you don't read him. And you travel through Plato, you don't read Plato. You travel through Plato, you walk with him. Um, I think the question I think the question asked me about myself or my own process. Can you remind me, correct? Yes, it's uh, just one sec. Uh, if there, uh, how poesis comes to you and through you in the context of beautifully structured language? I don't know. I, I get presuming that it does. Does it? I don't know. If I, <laughs> I don't even know if the premise of the question is something I can I can assent to or not. Um, well, if I should be so lucky and agree with its premise. I don't know. I don't know where to go from there. I, I can tell you that I can tell you that I feel it most. Well, I feel it obviously most in the flow state. I feel it most when I'm not conscious of it. I feel it most when it seems to call itself out. Um, I feel it most when I'm speaking into the listening ear, when I feel that ear is attuned and comprehending and very, very attentive. The listening ear seems to draw it forth without any volition of mine. And I'll be honest with you, in this moment, in this particular moment and in this in this forum, I'm finding this more, and, and please take this in the spirit it's intended, this is a welcome and interesting deviation from my, from, from my experience thus far. But I'm finding this, for instance, in this moment, more difficult than talking to a single interlocutor. Because when I'm talking to a single interlocutor, I understand to whom I'm speaking. 
And I understand that there is a great deal more to someone speaking if it's a good conversation. And so understanding the, the ear into whom I am speaking seems to naturally affect the speech that occurs through me. I don't lay any claim on it. Um, talking to a group of people, as I feel I'm doing now, and I'm, you know, you'll have to ex excuse me my, my discomfort, is that I'm not completely sure. I mean, I know, I know a couple people to whom I'm speaking, but I'm not exactly sure to whom I'm speaking. That's a very different experience. That's a very different experience. Even writing, I still always, I still always have a sense that there is a single thou to whom I'm speaking. I mean, that's that's how Augustine wrote his Confessions. He was speaking to a single thou. And so, I think the poesis of speech depends, at least for me, and perhaps in general depends on the figuration of its respondent, of its listener. Everything has to do with its listener. And that's why the listening and the conversation is as, if not more important than its speech, because it is the listening presence and attention that ultimately guides and leavens the speech into its greatest possible form. Thanks. Skylar, you had something to say to Chris. Did you, did you, did you want to go ahead? Or I can. Um, sure, you can, or I can. I don't know if you guys hear me. Yeah, go ahead. We can, we can hear you. I was just trying to find where I wrote that. <laughs> For some reason, I uh, lost it. But essentially, I'm just, I'm very interested in the reinvent project. And um, <clears throat> Chris, you seem to have a real talent with glossolalia. You kind of somehow get in this little trance state where you can kind of flow. And if you've, if you're up to date with your guys' lexicon, you can get a whole lot of information. So um, I just mostly wanted to say thank you. And do you have anywhere where we can read more of the books you kind of read? Any of the the more audit the more esoteric alchemical takes you have on things where where can i find stuff to read that or other other people to listen to mm. well first of all thank you for that Skylar. that's very it's very kind of you to say that um and um uh what what uh okay where can you find more of what i read um that's a good question I mean, I'm not, you know, so it's funny, I, I, I'm not as, I'm not as voracious a reader, I mean, I, obviously, there's a certain amount that's kind of required even to stay up to speed with these kinds of conversations, but I'm not as voracious a reader as I think, um, well, certainly not as much as someone like John, but boy, is that a poor comparison, because <laughs> very few people are, um, but um but I would say I, I, a lot of my, my, my sources of influence are really not dissimilar from the sources of influence that, um, that, that John tends to refer to in his lectures. Um, um, Plato and Plotinus feature very prominently. Jung, for me, features very, very prominently. Tillich, as well, features very prominently. Increasingly, Heidegger, uh, and then secondary sources that refer to those primary ones. Um, but, you know, what's funny is that I, I find myself, sorry, I'm, I'm answering a question that you didn't ask, but it seems more honest than to try and answer your question directly, Skylar. I hope you'll, you. I hope you'll take that. That's right. Thank you. Um, I, I hope you'll take that uh, again in the spirit it's intended. But I, I find that I become so. Um, my experience with reading is very odd because it, it's, it tends to spin me off very quickly. Um, I seldom get through books because I'm so preoccupied with my marginalia in those books that um, 
that I get endlessly distracted and endlessly sidetracked. I, I, my relationship with books is very dialogic, very, very dialogic. I don't consume them. I, I riff off of them. And, and I, th then this is, I'm, this, I don't say this proudly because in many ways it frustrates this, this, this particular proclivity of mine frustrates me because it means that I can often not stay trained volume of anything for very long before spinning out and doing something entirely different. I end up writing for, which, um, occur often occurs to me probably isn't a very good thing and yet for whatever reason i actually can't stop myself from doing it learning far, far more improvising my way around a book or around a paper or around an argument rather than committing it patently to lexical knowledge i think in that way my ability and my approach to these things is far more poetical than it is classically philosophic or classically academic. Um, and I actually struggle with that impulse um, because sometimes it's appropriate and sometimes it's adaptive and serves me well and sometimes it is not. And sometimes it does not serve. It makes life a little bit more difficult. So I would say there is no, you know, my thinking doesn't anchor itself in any secret text. Um, it has much more to do with the way I relate to the texts that are canonical to most people. And um, so if there's a, if you're asking after a secret sauce or anything like that, um, I suppose that would be the, the best way of framing it. Sorry, that was, that didn't answer your question, but. No, it I did actually. Okay. No, it did, because you said you young in the, the ideas around him and how chemical texts when I like I married by a man who's now a reverend and uh, he gave me his books, quite a few of his books right before he moved. And then mm -hmm. on the move, everything he owned burned. So I have his only oh, no. books that have his notes, you know, his glossolalia, his marginalia. I have all his notes and stuff. And that book is so much more powerful just because I have his thoughts in the book also. So I think I kind of see what you said when you say you start to kind of move in a, in those things and then you kind of get spun off maybe, but you are actually consuming them properly. You're not just trying to get through them to say you read the book. That's so right. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, thank you. No, you've, you've taken my meaning beautifully. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Adrian, you, you had a question. Uh, yeah, uh, have you read uh, Byung Chun Han's book, The Burnout Society? And if yes, what do you think about it? I haven't read that one. I've read um, the um, um, I've read The Scent of Time. He, I, I, his uh, his books are, are like high up in the queue. Um, they're high up in the queue. Um, so I can't speak to the Burnout Society specifically. Uh, I can say that the sense of time had a, had a huge influence on on my thinking, and and incidentally, you know, if we're talking about form and style, Byung Chul Han is a very interesting example because he has a way of writing. I remember thinking to myself after reading the sense of time that there was a lot of repetition, a lot of formal repetition, stylistic repetition in his book, even though it's a very short book. And I, I can, I know I have a similar tendency when, especially when writing about something whose core components are not yet clear, even to me, there's a lot of circling around something. There's a lot of revolution that happens in the writing process. And I, I hope I'm not interpolating too much where Han is concerned, but I can actually see a lot of that. I feel as though when I read Han in the limited way that I've done, I can feel his process of reckoning. I can feel his contemplative process in the form of the way he writes in addition to the content of his writing. I can feel the world of his text and I can feel it. I can feel its recursions and repetitions as a way of lathering me further and further and further into its insights. Um, so anyway, that, 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 um, 
yeah, I can't speak to the burnout society, but my experience of reading the Scent of Time, I not only do I not only do I find his propositions very compelling and persuasive, but the manner in which they're presented is very evocative and exemplifying of of the very phenomenon that he's trying to explain. And I think that's a that's part of what makes him I mean he's a very Heideggerian philosopher and so that explains a lot unto itself, right? But that to that to me that kind of induces what makes him a good philosopher is its form. We just have a couple questions left. Uh, really appreciate your time here. Uh, could I ask, what are your thoughts on whether Christians today can shift into viewing Christ's resurrection symbolically rather than literally without losing the power it has for them? Uh, you crackled a little bit for me there as sure. you asked that question. I got something in the significance of Christmas uh, and about the resurrection, but you're going to have to repeat it for me. Sorry. What are your thoughts on whether Christians today... Here, let, let me get that. Yeah, sorry. My internet's bad today. Yeah, it's okay. I'll, I'll... I think I might have to, I also might have to read the, uh, the question just because I can't quite get it. Uh, you, you can click on the event text uh, right over the event hall. Oh. And that'll and just scroll to near the bottom. That that'll give you. So it's by Kadai. Uh, okay. Sorry, can you say that again? The, give me that instruction again. The event text. Here, here let me just read. It. Oh, it's fine. Uh, what are your thoughts on whether Christians Thank today you. can shift into viewing Christ's resurrection symbolically rather than literally, without losing the power it has for them? Yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, I think that in a way that question is about whether, I mean, I might make the argument, and others have made it, people like Edward Kranz and Jung made a version of this argument, that the way in which people understood, the way in which, you know, the way in which Christians of antiquity understood the resurrection was indeed symbolic. That understanding the resurrection literally is in fact a modern conceit of some species of modern conceit, and that the symbolic understanding of the resurrection, the living within the patterns invocated by that symbolic activity, is actually the form of reality that it conduced for Christians of antiquity. So I'm actually going to frame this question, going to take the liberty of framing this question as a recollective one. Can we go back to something like that? Um, individuals, I think, Certainly, I would imagine so. I would imagine that individuals can salvage a symbolic experience of the resurrection. Can enough individuals salvage the experience of the resurrection symbolically for it to be for it to be renewed as a kind of religious commons? I don't know. I don't know. I think that, I mean, Christian, I mean, Christmas is one of those things that has become so beleaguered and put upon over the course of time by all kinds of idolatrous meanings and philosophical reductions. I don't know if it can be recovered from that. I mean, I'm not, a, I'm not, you know, my, um, my relationship with Christianity is very ambivalent and very complicated. So, you know, I, I say this, I suppose, um, I, I say this, uh, uh, um, as a, as a very wayward, if I'm a Christian, I'm, I'm very much a wayward Christian and I'm not exactly, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not, I don't presume to offer an apology um, or a, I'm not convinced, let me put it this way. I'm not convinced enough myself that the rituals and calendar and sacraments of Christianity can be revivified for enough people to be regained as a religious worldview. I'm not, I, w I certainly wouldn't say never, but I'm not convinced of it. 
I'm not convinced it's possible. And there is absolutely no joy in my believe me, none at all. Struan asks, symbolically, is suchness to moreness as necessity is to sufficiency? Mm, that's a good question. Um, I, I, I don't know if they map perfectly. I might, I might tinker with that a little bit and say that suchness to moreness is something more like necessity to possibility um, than sufficiency. Um, yes, I think, I think as a I think as a loose mapping, I think there's something there. Yes, yes. I mean, there's a reason that, you know, something like Kierkegaard's synthesis of self is, falls at the center of several apparent dichotomies. One of those dichotomies being that between necessity and possibility. And it is precisely the disposing of possibility within the bounds of necessity that resolves the despair that is otherwise inherent to that synthesis. And I think that there's something very, very powerful to that. And I think there is something analogous that is being done that I'm working with John on right now between suchness and moreness, that their mutual impregnation, and I, and I use that metaphor very purposefully because it then affines itself to the midwifery metaphors of philosophy that the mutual impregnation of suchness and moreness as between possibility and necessity is something that is only conduced by a powerful symbol that can make a turn into um, that can make a turn into anagogy. Anagogy being that kind of um, the kind of ascent of the soul that we associate with with sort of climbing the great chain of being. That that's the sort of the old Platonic, Neoplatonic, and Christian worldviews, the more mystical versions of it that, that involve a normative ascent to the great chain of being, a kind of self-transcendence and a theosis of the soul, that those kinds of things that, that, are, that are represented by the process of anagoge um, is, um, is, is precisely affected by managing to present the mystery of mourness in a given Thank you. I was wondering if for the final question, you could just give us a bit of a preview of what to expect on the new book you're working with, John. Mm. So um, it's an, we're working on an anthology right now, the subtopic of which is inner and outer dialogue. We're trying to, uh, we're trying to, as, as well as possible, we're trying to find, we're trying to, to, to find, to get ourselves as close as possible to the center of the kairos that is emerging in these dialogical practices. And to do that, we've, um, we've convened several contributors to, um, to, to, to basically um, contemplate the topic of dialogue in whatever discipline they're most familiar with or they're most learned in, to try and understand what the relationship between dialogues, interpersonal dialogues like this between persons um, in, in, that, in a very classical model and intrapersonal or intrapsychic dialogues, um, the, kind that, um, the kind that were originated you know, by, by the early Stoics and Christians, people like Marcus Aurelius and Augustine, who interiorized the dialectical process and used it as a way of probing interior mystery. Um, we're trying to to collapse those two ways of understanding dialogues together to see if they can make sense of one another. And um, so anyway, uh, John and I um, are working on a couple of chapters. A couple of the chapters will be um, will be ones that we've worked on with uh, with a few other author authors. One one that uh, I'm working on right now is co-authored with uh, with John and also Guy Sengstock and Jordan Hall uh, because it's based on a dialogue that we had together that's on YouTube uh, some time ago, and it was based on transcribing that dialogue and trying to understand how one dialogue can exemplify the dialogic process and um, 
and, um, and articulate out its features as to understand exactly what's going on and how that can be a model for understanding how to set the conditions for the LLB. So that's, uh, that's what we're working on right now and uh, through the summer and, uh, and hopefully come the fall closer to the calendar year with any luck that, uh, that will come to fruition. Well, this has been great. I want to thank you so much uh, for coming today. Uh, I know you're, you're, you're not the biggest fan of the, the online, of the online uh, mediums, but, but hopefully you could see something that we're doing here uh, that, that, that's worthwhile doing and, and you're, you're welcome back anytime. We'd love to have you. Uh, I think they're, uh, reading the comments here, people are expressing thanks and uh, especially talk, your, your linguistic flow and your use of language is, uh, is, has been deeply admired by, by, our, by our members. And uh, so I really thank you for being here today. Well, thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Brett, for, uh, for, for making this so easy for me. Uh, and thank you all, really. I never, I, mean, I never take it for granted that, uh, that anyone at any given time has any interest in uh, what, what I might have to say on anything. So this is, um, this is a humbling experience. It's, it's immensely gratifying. And I mean, the, the questions are, what great questions. Um, they're really, they're really incisive and smart and, and gesture to the center of what is important about all of this. So my, you know, my, my, my reluctance for virtual environments, notwithstanding, I mean, clear this, the value of this is overwhelmingly manifest patent to me. I need no convincing of it. Um, so thank you all for your time. And uh, yeah, I, I'd be delighted to do more of this and, uh, and talk with you folks more. Thank you. Thanks again, Chris. And thank you everyone for being here. Uh, coming up next week, we've got, uh, well, John will be here on Monday for, for the bi-weekly or bi-monthly Q&A. Uh, on Thursday, next Thursday, the 25th, we've got J.P. Marceau uh, coming by, uh, who, who works very closely with uh, Jonathan Peugeot. Uh, and, and please check out our, our calendar. Uh, it's pinned in the announcements. The pinned uh, post of the announcements has a link. We're, we're having more and more planned events uh, on this Discord uh, of all different types. So please check out the calendar and check it daily. And thanks everyone for being here and asking questions. And uh, yeah, I hope you come again. <laughs>